Our local guy, Palm Air. Uh, Take your Harbor area. Um, he's a graduate of uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and he's going to share some great information today with us about private matters. Okay. Uh, All right. So um, my talk today is exploiting data and rethinking privacy. Uh, this is not about personal privacy. This is about what happens after you have to give up your data to that third party to complete medical transaction or complete financial transaction or all the other things that we need to do to exist in the modern world. Uh, I mostly just want us to rethink how we think about privacy when it comes to technology. And so without that, uh, that mind, um, if you want to get in touch with me on Twitter, I'm at Privacy Critic, keeping, keeping the theme, and uh, a little more about me. So I'm IPP certified, I have completed the CISP exam, I'm a few years away from being certified. I got, I went to school, um, I like to volunteer, I love the CTF Academy that IC Square puts on, and as of today I'm a B-Size right now. So, so, here's the overview. First, I want to frame how we think about privacy today, what laws, what expectations go into how you see privacy in the modern world. Then we're going to talk about how the goals of security, the whole point of this b size conference, and privacy overlap. We're going to look at what, well, in the privacy world, it's called an intersection attack. How can you cross-reference data across sets in order to enrich your information about a target? Then we're going to do, present some solutions, give a little recap, and I'll leave you guys with some information that if you want to join the conversation around privacy or just read up on it, for the solutions. So without further ado, framing the conversation. Brief history of privacy. In 1789, James Madison introduced the Fourth Amendment. Before this, there was a lot of issue with the British acting on general warrants. They operated under, we're going to just collect, we're going to go in and search all your stuff, as long as you haven't done anything wrong, you have nothing, you have no reason to fear. They didn't like that. Because obviously, not only are you completely undermining the values of your citizens, there are all sorts of reasons that they can come up with for what they found being used against them. So, in 1789, I want to remind you, we won the Revolutionary War, but America wasn't actually a country yet. They were weighing the values of privacy and security right now, and they went for privacy. They said that a citizen in America, in the United States, has a right to privacy over the expectation of having to worry about general warrants. He's the original privacy bro. <laughs> Cats versus the United States, we move forward a little bit. This has to do with the individual who's placing cross-state gambling bets, which even today is illegal, using telephone codes. When the authorities found out about it, they knew, after telling a little bit, which telephone codes he was actually going to to place the bets. So, their solution was to bug the telephone codes. Which would have been fine, except when they sent him to trial, he protested and went all the way up to the Supreme Court, where they said, once he had closed the door to the phone booth, he had an expectation of privacy. The set of precedent that, even though I'm in public, there are places where I can expect privacy. Building on that momentum, Smith versus Maryland. This is actually the flip, su flip side. A man whose first name moves me right now. Robbed a woman with a money car while driving a money car. And the woman expressed that this is what the guy looks like, he's driving his car. And the man, being completely full of himself, decided, well, now that I know the woman's information from stealing her purse, I'm going to call her, like literally every single day, and tell her to come to the window where he would drive by his money car. So, having plenty of self respect, she called the authorities and said, hey, this guy keeps calling me, and I'm pretty sure he's the guy robbing me. So they waited literally just a handful of hours for him to call again, and then they pulled the phone records. And what they did was they were able to find out that, all right, this guy's phone number matches the description of the person who robbed this woman, in fact, called her number. He protests, he goes up to the Supreme Court, and what they find is that, yes, you have an expectation to privacy. If I'm going to record that conversation, I need a warrant. But, in order to complete the phone call, he had to give his phone number and her phone number for the company to connect the call. This is a lot of where the mass collection of their data comes in. This is information that wasn't specifically the conversation, but about the conversation. 
that the government does not need a warrant to collect, which is why you're seeing so many of these programs where they're sweeping up metadata about phone calls, location data, any piece of information they can get their hands on. And then, if you want to bring it even further into the future, Helen Nissenbaum, in at least 2008, published a book, Privacy in Context, which has one of my favorite quotes about how to think about data privacy. As a, it's neither a right to secrecy or control, but it is a right to the appropriate flow of information. This is all built around contextual integrity. Damn it. This thing is not cooperating. Contextual integrity, which says that there are all sorts of different things in the world that govern how we, or what situation we share under, what kind of information we're sharing, and why. So it's literally asking the question, what is appropriate? And that's what I want you guys to think about while I go through the rest of my examples in this talk. When you see the data set, you see what happens to the data set, I want you to think what was expected to happen and what actual harms come. <laughs> now, how do privacy and security goals overlap? I want to just, it's a little dry, but we're going to look at a couple of the big security, I guess, definitions, you call them. I saw 2015, you were protected against disclosure from unauthorized users and improper modification. CNS instruction 4009 from 2010, unauthorized access, use disclosure, disruption, modification, and destruction. Ventures in the law of taxonomy of security, minimizing the risk of exposing information. So the theme is we want to make sure you protect your data. And we'll talk about the CIA try in a second. But if your goal is how am I going to protect my data, you're actually meeting a lot of the expectations of privacy. And in the United States, the FTC has written the Fair Information Privacy Practices, which is my favorite acronym, in case, about how to approach privacy as an organization. If I'm going to collect data, I need to give notice and make it clear that I'm going to be collecting your data. I need to give get informed consent and give them an actual choice. If they opt in, that's awesome. If they don't, I shouldn't collect their information. Now, you're going to see, in the real world, this is kind of weird, because a lot of organizations if you don't opt in, you can't use the service period. There's a lot of discussion around that. But again, I want you to think about it, but not focus on it. <laughs> then you have to give access. Anyone who's trusting you with their information should be expected to see what information you have about them and be able to modify anything that they feel is out of date or incorrect. Then, of course, the security conference, protect your stock guys. So, and enforce them. Just because, like, in America we take a we promise we're doing this approach, but in other countries like Germany and Canada, they have very top-down regulatory bodies going to companies, checking their stuff. And then the, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, as dub. So these are more abstract concepts, can't find funny names for them, but data accuracy and integrity. So a mix of access and security. We want to make sure that the information is accurate, we want to make sure that it has not been modified by someone other than the person. Use limitation. I say I'm going to collect information for a particular reason. I'm not going to sell it because I didn't say I was going to. I'm not going to give it to someone else and try and cross-reference it with other data because that's not why I said I was collecting the data for. And then honesty don't We want to build trust. If you don't build trust, no one's going to trust you with their data. You want to show that you're committed to collecting their information and make it easy for them to get in touch. And then, if I had to choose where in the CIA triad, since everyone loves to bring this up every single time there's a talk, the private, or where I think privacy fits, it's fundamental to all three. All right, so that's all the dry stuff. Let's go to the fun stuff. Everyone loves to pass. Netflix. 2000, well, 2006 they started this. It was a competition to see if they could improve the rating system for the Netflix rating algorithm. And I want to be clear, this is 06. It's like people who are hardcore Netflix fans get DVDs, that's real streaming service. They release a data set of anonymized information, 500,000 records, movie rated, or 500,000 individuals' information, over 100 million records, uh, movie ratings, when they were rated, and a randomized ID to be able to link ratings across the set. Anyone interested, Belcourt's Pragmatic Chaos. One by improving it by 10.6%, it was, I think, 86.5 at the end of it. And they won the million dollar prize. But researchers at UT Austin in 08 thought, all right, that's cool and all, but what if 
instead of trying to be nice and help improve the algorithm, we tried to figure out who was inside the data set. So they had to find a large enough data set, and at the time, IMDB had a pretty dedicated following of people who were giving hardcore ratings to all their favorite movies, and you can probably guess where they're getting their movies from. So they wanted to see if there was overlap in the system to where they could find just a subset of one, being able to uniquely identify a person with any data sets. What they found was that if you eliminate, and they did this in three ranges, but the most significant is eliminating the 1,000 most popular movies, if you ignore those, you look at all the other movies that these people are looking at, if you have eight lesser known movies, even with two of them being completely incorrect, they were able to re-identify 99% of the data set. What that means is they identified people in IMDb that they had a very high confidence for in the Netflix data set. And again, this is just usernames, but still, the implications are significant. Now remember, context. This was the data set that was used for research. The damage, you're starting to identify people across platforms. Now, I want to stay with this example because this works off of an idea called key anonymity, which is fundamental to how people release research data. Key anonymity is about buckets. The idea is, if I'm going to release information for research, I want to make sure that there is no, as we saw in that silly Venn diagram on the first slide, there's no set of one. Because the size of the bucket is, or minus one, is the amount of anonymity you provide. So, a bucket of one means there's no anonymity. So, if I have a bucket of three people, if there's some unique information I know about my target, I can get me down to one, I can identify that. This is a common practice for how people release research data, especially for medical purposes, without having to add randomization. So, in the Netflix data set, this is a simplified example, a lot more went into it, but after they normalized for the fact that IMDb is a 10-point system, and Netflix is a 5-star system, we were able to start going off the idea that, all right, let's assume that my target in the IMDb set liked The Incredibles with a 5-star rating. That doesn't tell me which of these five people it is. But I know that Captain America, sorry, so the anonymity <laughs> set is 4, 5 times 1. Now, if I add the ratings for Captain America, I know that they have a 2-star rating for Captain America, I know now it's either Michelle or Jane. Now my key anonymity has gotten number one. And now my target, I know they have aliens, one star, so I know it's Michelle, and anonymity is zero. And then when we add ratings for the room, we know Michelle has terrible taste in movies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool and all, that's all movie data. What happens if we play with higher stakes? Let's say I'm a researcher at Carnegie Mellon, and I purchased Cambridge Area Motor Information for $20, and it arrives to me on two CDs. This is O2. So, you know, let's get stuff from the internet, we're just calling. This is what that data set looks like. You have all sorts of interesting, unique public information. And then you think to yourself, all right, what other information is publicly available there? Well, the Group Insurance Commission was responsible for managing all the medical insurance information for individuals working in government in that area. And their data set looks like this. And you'll notice that zip, birth date, and sex are both very granular and also present in both sets. So the sets are small enough that you can look at the birth date, zip, and sex and still be able to re-identify someone, such as the governor of Massachusetts. That's not nothing. That is medical information, that is billing, that is voter information. That is significant to how we act as a democracy. And this is 2002. So remember, this is public information. This was, and here's the best part, it was given to researchers by the company and then sold to industry. So you know, they didn't ask for that. The company just decided to do it. And I'm sure, I'm sure there was plenty of Terms and condition nonsense to get around that. But think about the harm. And there's more. My favorite data set is the New York taxi data set. And I'm sure you're all thinking, hmm, no one uses taxis, everyone uses Uber. Exactly. Because what I'm about to show you, I want you to think about the implications in the context of Uber. 
They have a constant public record data set. When I looked at this, it was 09 to 2015, and the researchers were looking at over 173 million trips. I mean, brand new data. We have license number, medallion number, pickup drop off locations, pickup drop off times. I put out one thing. The medallion number, they had, I think it was an MD5 hash. So anyone who knows anything about security, that was not hard to get around. This information was released under a Freedom of Information Act by the researchers. So now all the data is public for a government sanctioned reason. What did they do? The two other data sets I've had to look at was one for research, one for completely reasonable other things. What happens when I care about one target and I just Google for the data? Can anyone tell me who that is? I know it's kind of a blurry photo. Is it accurate? Nope. Bradley Cooper. In the data set, we're able to identify his trip from his hotel to Greenwich Village, where I believe he's going to the Bolivia. He was dropped off right in front of it, so I was pretty confident he's going there for dinner. It was around dinner time. And I had his fair information. Anyone know who that is? Again, a little blurry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jessica Hall. She went from her place in the Trump Soho to Midtown, and she didn't tip. That, that had the data set. She didn't tip. <laughs> so, this is very granular data. This is, every record is medallion numbers, trip information, pricing, and that's without telling you who the person is. This is based on paparazzi photos that show you an idealistic pickup location and time and the license plate number of the cab. So, you can be fairly confident in your guessing. But think about Uber. They know who you are. You don't have to go look at paparazzi photos to figure out anyone here to be Uber, right? And then when they decided to get really creative, they figured out how many people were getting picked up in close enough proximity and at just enough of the right time from government facilities that were ending in strip clubs. <laughs> and one of the main things to point out that was actually a strip club was um, Larry Friends Hustle Club is a fairly isolated location in Hell's Kitchen that uh, made the made them be able to guess with relatively high confidence based on the drop-off time that if any of them were telling them that they were telling their spouses that they were working with, that's pretty much what it was. So, what can we do about these massive disclosures? Because remember, this is data that we didn't really have a right in discussing how it was going to be handled once we gave it away. Health insurance information? What are you going to do? Not have health insurance? You need to pay your bills. And voter information is already up there. Taxicab data compared to Uber or Lyft data? These are just massive sets. So one of the solutions, and I'm, I'll say I'm not a fan of Uber as a company. They do some Facebook level weird things, but they created Uber Movements, which is a API that sits on top of their data. So the Freedom of Information Act request for the New York Taxicab data set was for city planning purposes. They beat them to the punch by creating an API that says, all right, if you know your pickup location, you know your drop-off location, and you know your time of day, you should be able to figure out the number of trips you're expected to see, how long it's going to take, all sorts of reasonable, reasonable statistical information around the trips. So you're actually helping by putting your people into going back to Canada and very big buckets. But what happens if you have very unique rides and you're suddenly still able to identify people who are working very late at night or taking trips in the middle of the day and there's low traffic flow? Privacy professionals have all sorts of different ideas about how to approach it. But the one I want to focus on because of how I got to explore it in the context of the researchers for Riding with the Stars is differential privacy. So the premise is let's pretend I have these two medical data sets. The left one is with your information, just one person extra, and the other one is with that. If I try to do any sort of summary statistic, number of people with this blood type, whatever, you'll know that the two data sets are not equal. And that right there is how you start identifying people and start being able to exploit their information to learn more about them. What differential privacy says is we can add noise. We can find a mathematical equation that depending on your query, we can add a certain amount of noise. And what that will do is make it so that when we do the summary statistic, 
the two sets will look the same. Now, the value differential privacy and the difficulty is you have to be very clever in thinking about how you're going to get a query-specific amount of noise. So if you have a lot of data, you can probably get away with very little noise. If you have very little data, some of your noise is going to increase. That value is governed by something called epsilon, and that's a whole math thing, and the notes are in my slides, so feel free to go read that. I'm not going to go too deep into epsilon. But what this looks like in practice is Microsoft researchers created privacy integrated queries built on top of like everyone's favorite .NET nonsense machine. Yep. Yeah. I'm not a .NET fan. I'll say that. <laughs> created by Frank McSherry, a fantastic Microsoft researcher who does not return any of my emails. <laughs> For my research, one of my research projects in Carnegie Mellon, I applied differential privacy to trip volume and to average speed. So when you manipulate the epsilon value, that's going to manipulate how you read those summary values. But if you do it really well, you keep the same trend over the course of your data. If you do it really poorly, it looks like this. So what you can see is the same average, the same trends are still there in the data. But here, the trends based on your epsilon value are starting to uh, peak further away or closer to what you actually expect. The smaller your epsilon, the crazier your data is going to look. And the bigger epsilon, the closer you're going to get to what the data actually looks like. So again, different opinions what that value should be. What's it look like in geospatial data? These are trips from LaGuardia to Manhattan. So in the same logic around how am I going to do city planning, I want to see how many drop-off locations are most popular in the city. If I set my epsilon value really high, you see the trend maps with Manhattan pretty well. If I set it really low, people are getting dropped off in the river, it's terrible. <laughs> But that's the thing we want to think about. The goal was to do planning. You can apply differential privacy to achieve these goals without letting any person with data set be out. Apple says that if you opt into their iCloud data sharing, they will apply differential privacy so that they can get statistics. I don't trust Apple, but I'm willing to give them a shot to see how this goes. I'm not Apple users, by the way. So you guys, any, all you Apple users, good luck with that. So, quick recap. Privacy is fundamental. People who live in America have a constitution, a bill of rights, all of which respect your right to both saying whatever you want and not being judged for it, but also not saying whatever you want and not being questioned for it. Privacy and security overlap. When you need privacy expectations inside your systems, you can actually expect that you need a lot of security goals. Data overlap can be devastating to people in the data sets. Maybe a movie is not as big of a deal when we look at medical data, voter information, trip information. I believe the keynote speaker kept talking about how people were taking trips in their fancy feature smart cards and now we're being outed. That's a problem. And then we want to rethink how we share. Is there a better way for us to get the information out there? So, remember end case. Notice, you have to get informed consent. You have access to the people whose data set you collect, protect it, and make sure that other people are doing their job. You want to make sure that you ask fundamental questions like, what is my data for? And you want to think about how much granularity is in your data. Do I need to do more to make my buckets bigger? Or do I need to rethink? how I'm going about collecting all together. Then you can always summarize and add noise. It might not work 100% of the time. There are some special edge cases, such as with geospatial data, where you see that adding noise can make it harder for the data to actually look realistic. But there's lots of people working very hard every day to see if we can make it better so that we can protect people's information as large companies. So my closing thoughts. Privacy adds a lot of value. When you limit your exposure, you're doing a lot. First of all, we heard the keynote speak about social engineering attacks. If you think about privacy, whenever there is a data leak, that information out there can be used against you. If I know your voter information, I know your medical information, I can call you up and say, hey, can you please click on this email that has your medical information and then we just need to confirm something. That's a phishing attack. It builds trust in your product. 
If you show people that you're committed to only collecting what you need and protecting it and thinking about what you're going to do with the information and how you're going to treat your customers, they're going to trust you. They're going to feel more confident in your product and you're going to get a lot more traction. And then it might give you some insight to your product that you didn't see at first. Let's say, at first, I was thinking, all right, I'm going to collect all this information. No problem with that. Maybe I don't need as much information. How am I going to store it? How am I going to style the data? How long am I going to keep it? Fundamental security questions that can be solved when you focus on privacy. And so, moving forward, I'd like to give you guys some uh, recommended reading. The International Associ Association of Privacy Professionals, if anyone is interested, they are a organization based out of, I believe, New England, who are working very hard to bring privacy <coughs> just as an occupational goal. They have recommended readings such as Privacy by Design, Building Privacy Fundamentally into Your Systems, just like you want to have a security first approach to your products. Smart Grid, thinking about how we're not thinking about the future of technology and how it overlaps with people's privacy expectations. Privacy in Context, my personal favorite shout out. So, rethinking how do we approach privacy, what was expected, what actually happened. We also have some podcasts for all the podcasters out there. Codebreaker is pretty good. And Note to Self just did the privacy paradox. So I'll admit their website uses JS, and you probably don't want to go on their website. <laughs> but if you can have a if you have a podcast app, feel free to download Note to Self. The last five episodes were great. We're going to do a recap next week. And every episode has a recommendation to check out things like the Gothicon or think about using DuckDuckGo instead of Google. So again, that's more personal privacy. But to get to the big picture, the companies aren't giving us choices. And then, should you be so bold, Reddit obviously has a subreddit. So I'm going to leave in my uh, talk on this quote. A right to privacy is a right to the appropriate flow of personal information. I want everyone to just think about that. Regardless of what you do after this, if you go just hardcore security and you never care about privacy again, or you suddenly become the greatest privacy advocate on the planet, <laughs> privacy shouldn't be your goal of getting off the grid. You should be expecting companies to take your data and use it responsibly and give you options for how to protect your own data, even if you have to disclose it. Sources, sources, all right, Q&A. So going off that last point, kind of um, on the enforcement for the uh, case, uh, where do you say, like, or in your mind, where do you say like, the demarcation for other companies that use third parties to steer that data? So, I think any expectation you have to security auditing or any of the approaches we have to making sure that companies are taking efforts to protect their information and what that looks at like from a regulatory point, you should be thinking the same way about privacy. There should be third parties, you're correct, that in some way have to be certified and known to do hardcore privacy or leak investigating so that when people are going to these companies to get any sort of feedback, we know that there's standard or that there's a standard that says that they actually know their stuff just like any security company and that having them check out their product means something. There are a lot of companies out there like uh, SharePoint Privacy and Fair Warning that are privacy consulting companies and their approach is mostly we want to build the privacy into the product at a foundational level, but sometimes those companies their value stops as soon as the product's finished and the company thinks that, all right, it's made, we don't need to worry about that. We're worried about losing first mover advantage to buy sell. So time and money, I got to put another layer of security in, I got to put another layer of privacy in. That's another three months, four months of money. Yeah, the, the, the goal is just like security should have been thought about first. Sure. Yeah. I've worked on plenty of things. We're the Internet of Things. So this is the third major technology cycle. We've demonstrated that first mover advantage takes precedence over you know, uh, these other factors. And those are fair points. But you have to think, like other points in my talk, I'm pointing out that this isn't even a first mover thing. This is literally just a, we should have been thinking about this all along. And now people are really taking heat for it. So when it comes to Internet of Things, yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. I'd be happy to talk about that. But for right now, it's the expectations that if I'm going to, like when you put cameras in your home, you're putting cameras in your home. 
you should be thinking about the implications of thin cameras anywhere in your life. Well, my, my argument on that example is, you know, say next year, uh, we're using an old C library, mm -hmm. that's been known past the plot, but then I don't think there was. Then we move up to the next process, or not being can't be old or whatever. To get something out there, get that webcam, that A cam, that whatever name, whatever. That's, you know, so, I mean, you're showing again that they hadn't thought of there for the care. Yeah. And that's another issue is we have to look at this from a consumer protection and also from a top-down regulatory approach. Other, or other countries like Germany are taking massive efforts to make sure that anyone who's trying to expose data, collect data, or do anything that involves reporting anything is taking a privacy-first approach to how they're collecting the data, how they're storing the data, how they're not harming individuals. This has led to things like requiring that Google have servers in Germany. So any data they collect about Germans is in Germany. Sorry. Yeah. All all the cloud platforms are required to do that. Sorry. So given how little blowback most companies receive for any sort of breaches or leaks like this, especially the health data, where was the impetus coming from to apply this, if not from a regulatory standpoint? I'm curious about that too. Because, because right they make now, money yeah. out of spreading their information as far and wide as possible. They have no incentive to add privacy to anything. Exactly. People that suffer the consequences are not the people with the ability to do anything about it. So, so the common, uh, the common response is what with your wallet. So there are companies out there that are putting privacy first. Spider uh, just listed another one, but uh, they're based on price. They're all taking the efforts to make sure that you have end to end encryption even inside their platform. So Spyro created a JavaScript framework called Crypton.io, and its entire premise is once the information leaves your machine, it's already encrypted, any information stored in the Spyro 1 cloud storage is encrypted, and any information returned to you is encrypted until it gets to your machine. So the thing is, you're seeing now that people are thinking more about privacy, about these security breaches, about how the consequences of having their information something thrown out there is coming back to hurt them in terms of credit reports, um, identity fraud, and just ransomware. But isn't that just an opportunity for them to sell you protection products? How's <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, though. Is there there is a opportunity if you expect to exist online. You want to think you need to expect things in again your own context. Am I trying to protect my information to the level that I expect it to be protected? If I was just having a conversation, if the answer is no, and I'm okay with having my information out there, that's your choice. But until we get more enforcement. Your only options are removing some rules. Enforcement from where? Top down, third parties, or even just the company stepping up. So you mean more like in Germany? Germany, Canada. A lot of the EU actually has a lot around data privacy, so they, have, they had to make safe harbor to make it so that America could be doing business with them. But they have things like a right to privacy that they acknowledge that it's a little late for certain things, so they can have Google. Uh, take information. Uh, it means that you can't scrub it from the internet. You can at least bury the links. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for probably adding on to her comments. As a consumer, my ISP is capturing every website I go to. For an app on my phone, uh, they call it sharing, they call it taking. And then they have the right to share and sell it to the data brokers. And before long, everybody's got my data. And I might be encrypted at the end to start with, but at some point, somebody gets exploited and I'm open. And there's just so much. And, and as you're showing on your on your example, they can put a couple of data sets together and know who I am. So where was there any privacy? So um, maybe I did a poor job of explaining this at the start. But that's my goal. <coughs> this talk is saying, hey, this is the issue. You're completely right. I know I've asked on my phone that I do everything in my power to make sure that I've turned up every single setting that would imply sharing data or any sort of manipulation of my data, but 
this is the goal. We need to start this conversation. We need to start focusing more. We need to be talking to congressmen, senators, any individual who we can get to say, hey, we as Americans have a right to privacy. It's in the Fourth Amendment. There's no reason why we should be able to. Uh, actually, we don't have an explicit right to privacy. It's not what they expect. It's right to be expected privacy. Um, I, I kind of like that we'll get a couple of other arguments where, you know, we're not going to be able to have to find privacy just due to the way uh, all the different sources of data that are important for us. If we can just, uh, you know, have the people who have our data that steward their data, you know, increase uh, how they protect it. Uh, I personally like that Facebook takes my information and gives me ads and all sorts of stuff based on what I'm doing. I, I, I'm not sure that that's not true. That's completely fine with me. But that's the thing is, you being okay with it doesn't mean everyone's okay with it. And also, giving, making it an opt-in as opposed to opt-out approach is more significant for more people because you have to think about your flip side, which is, what am I expecting them to know about me? If you look at Facebook, I think they have like 50,000 different categories of how you classify a person. And then you have to think about what that actually comes back to them in terms of online behavioral advertising. We've seen Target basically send an email to a father saying congratulations on your daughter or your daughter's pregnancy when she didn't even tell him yet. She didn't. She was worried and wasn't even sure she was going to keep the baby. And we've had things like people who are trying to go into AA and quit being alcoholics, getting served alcoholism ads, and being served literally just any ad that would fall under search criteria that was expected from the data they've been searching. You're losing your contacts. The other issue with the Facebook thing. So, with government data sets, you at least have freedom of information. With a private company, you have no way to um, check that what they are doing, for example, any research that they might be doing, would follow what, for example, a university with um, ethical standards and a, and a review board would approve. So, for example, any kind of experimentation, if they want to go back to um, imagine your most ethical experiment from Nazi Germany or wherever, wherever your most ethical, your least ethical experiment would be, insert here. Uh, if they want to do that, they could. You have no recourse. You can't even see the workings of the black box. So, um, I guess um, I just. Um, that disconnect again between, um, you know, I, I personally feel like the data is mine, I, I own it. And in Europe, the data is yours, it belongs to you. But, but in the US, it does not belong to you because I collected it, I picked it up, that was mine. No, you didn't find it, keepers, you know. <laughs> so, here's, here's the main thing I want you to just think about technology. Only as good as the people who use it. And we also, being the people who are the trendsetters, creating the new technologies and algorithms, sometimes we were, look, or we were looking at who we lead. That's where you start to see all these issues. So, what I'm saying is, yeah, terrible things are happening all the time when it comes to your data. So, the goal is we need to start the conversation, we need to rethink how we're approaching the uh, disclosure of the data, and just Taking the time to look at how you are sharing your information and seeing if there are alternatives. So I'll say one thing, ever since Donald Trump um, became president, a lot of people have been going on our privacy, asking for different encrypted chat tools. So if you are curious, you can go there real fast and then chat tools, email, uh, information sharing. But that's the thing is people aren't oblivious to these things. And again, it comes back to, in America at least, it's going to be a vote with your wallet kind of thing until we have a top-down change. So, sometimes that's awesome because there are small enough niches that you can vote with your wallet. Sometimes you're going to see bigger groups like Google who are going to make it really hard for you to interact without an online account. So, I'm curious, are you seeing companies that are actually realizing, so now that the average American is realizing what the repercussions of having your data taken and used against you, but for whatever reason, do you see, um, does it even look like the companies are trying to do something to help prevent that? 
and not like she was saying, they really don't have any repercussions. It's not like they have to pay me now because I lost you know, all of this stuff and it's their fault that happened. Are they even attempting to make a change or is it really truly just kind of in our needs and we have to figure out a way to force it upon them? Here, in America, at least, I'd say it's 50 50. Companies are not stupid. There are a lot of people who are trying to find the next way to appeal to customers. And one of those ways is privacy. But at the same time, you have to think about what you're sharing, why, how. And cost is huge for them to try to still all things secure. Yeah, so that's so yeah, going to my point about rethinking your technology from a privacy standpoint. Yes, I understand that it's three extra months of work, but I've been on projects that were expected to work without any security privacy, and they don't. So if a company is going to use that excuse, I want to see their products that they're rolling out with such efficiency. Well, part of it, what they do, they changed their fire as they interjected additional non-pregnancy related things into their things that infuse the possibility. We're not really tracking you. What's that? We're not really tracking you. Yeah, well, we're, we're we're so tracking you, but we don't want to think about it. Well, where's the transparency for that? Where can I go and look at this target source code and say to myself, yeah, I believe you. I'm or I'm not. Yeah. But even if you're not you can still, like they can't really interact with the world without not doing it. Yeah, it's almost like we are forced to into something and there's no repercussion for anybody but us, but we can't not do it or we won't be able to function in this society. Right. So I have a question. You talk about anarchy, um, it's largely a sense of largely a sense of work. And you have individual, you know, as far as like the whole government collection of data, and they're taking, scooping up all this data. The fact that they're collecting so much, I mean, there was an outcry about you know the number of phone calls, intercepts, basically they were scooping Does that actually increase the privacy for the individual because there's it makes it harder to identify what they're doing when they're scooping up millions of records that have nothing to do. with so, or you get lost in the shuffle, so to speak, and you can scoop up more. So, you're not wrong, but it's a good and bad thing. I have a big enough data set that it's really hard for me to be able to quickly identify individuals. So, like going back to the Netflix one, that was 500,000 dedicated users. Easier to crop up with stuff with IMDb and Netflix. I'm not on IMDb, but I'm on Netflix, so I'm sure if they tried to cross reference me, they won't be able to do so because I'm not on data set. But at the same time, when you think about behavioral advertising, you think about how they're trying to put you in a bucket for marketing purposes, that can come back to bite you. Because what happens if I'm not that person? What happens if... I know that there were different times where people were researching for writing novels or just general research, and they would look at things like murder and genocide and all sorts of horrible human acts. And that kind of search information goes into how these companies are going to look at you even if they don't have the context of why you're looking for their information. A little profound thought out there. Sure. Everybody says, in the debate world, you don't have any choice. You have to opt into everything. And I say, no, you not. I think that's kind of your thing, go for your wallet. I mean, this is an iPhone 4. <laughs> I don't have a single app on it. And that's intentional. They even say that I'm sacrificing my lifestyle, I can't do this, I can't do that. Or I'm walking the water fountain, playing with my phone. I control what data I give, at least I try to, I'm sure you can convince me that they know all about me no matter what I'm trying to do. So, so but I guess what you're saying is we need to recognize that there's a lot of exploitation, so we'll call it that out there. We need to talk to the companies, talk to the government, talk to ourselves, and try to be a, a movement to, to make this change instead of just saying, well, you know, there we go, I just thought. I, mean, I don't know if anyone's read through their health insurance disclosure information, <laughs> yeah. but in there, one of the things they say that they can disclose for is research purposes. So, yeah, that, Which, actually, from what you're saying, basically means all our medical records are public. So, Which I already have some. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, thank you for that, because I was going to mention anyone. Um, or when you go home, just a thought experiment. Read the terms of service of your favorite app and just do it. Because I'll admit, a lot of apps are actually trying to do a better job of making less legalese and more of a consolidated terms of disclosure that you can dig into if you really want to. At the same time, there's a lot of stuff they're giving out. Just as you mentioned, that 
we are agreeing to blindly, and that is part of the problem. So I understand that, like, yeah, it totally sucks because it's either you agree to all this garbage or you don't get to use their product. But it's not going to be easy. It's just not. I, if you're looking for me to give you the easiest solution about how to flip the switch, your privacy is going to be everywhere, I can't do that for you. Well, well I mean, you don't have to actually register for site. You don't give me a report of things. You don't yeah, you, I mean, you mix it up. Yes. Sorry, I want to recommend an app called Blur. Blur is made by a bean. B L U R. Made by a bean. Not to be confused with a bean. They'll actually generate, it's a password manager that will generate very strong passwords based on your criteria. And it will also generate fake email addresses. So I use it all the time when I want to sign up for Gerber sites. Looks like B L U R. Blur. And if there's a breach, you can track us back to the email I just connected. With me? Yeah, you should stop. When it comes to breaches, uh, what we try to find is we actually created a website that's dedicated to you being able to put in a username you'd commonly use or an email that you'd expect to use. And it'll show you in the set of data breach information that's been released to the public whether or not it's an SSL. So you'll know. What's that say? I don't remember. If, yeah, Troy Hunt's the researcher who did it. I had a previous point about that. But yeah, it's a discussion. We have lots of other organizations and companies and governments out there who are thinking about these things, and we can model ourselves after that when we can choose a completely new approach. But the thing I want to take away from here is think about how, if you work at a company, can you influence change? If you want to start your own company, how can you build a privacy product that not only will help you as a uh, selling point for your product, but also help you in how you're going to manage a product. And all sorts of different ways that thinking about privacy can help us. There's no perfect model, just like there's no perfect model for security. But we as people need to start thinking more about it. Cool. All right. So. I hope, I hope thank you. I'll talk next time and you can find me at, at Privacy Critic on Twitter. <laughs>